die suffering at the hands of Rome because they believed in Christ alone they died through Europe especially Spain for they saw all but Christ is vain he suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin 600 years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening. My name's Tom Fress, guest hosting for Walt Stickle on Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. It's my pleasure to be here once again tonight to continue our reading and discussion of this most magnificent and blessed Protestant work, a book that ought to be read by every man, woman, and child in this world. It's entitled Romanism and the Reformation from the Standpoint of Prophecy by Henry Grattan Guinness. Last week, we concluded the fifth of a series of lectures given by Henry Grattan Guinness back in the, er, the late 19th century, 1880-something or other, to a, an immense live audience. People flocked from all around to hear Henry Grattan Guinness tell the truth about Rome and about the Protestant Reformation. They came from miles around, both prince and potentate, and the common man came to listen to Henry Grattan Guinness reveal the truth, the biblical, historical, and prophetic truth about the Roman Catholic Church and about the papacy, the Antichrist, and the scarlet harlot of Revelation chapter 17. He was a champion of the Protestant Reformation. He was a champion of Jesus Christ. And I am blessed to my bones, to the marrow of my bones, to have the liberty and the freedom, at least enough in this country, to read this book, not only for myself, but to read it to any blood-bought Christian that is hungry for the truth. What a blessing this book has been to me and everyone who has heard it read. God empower me to bring forth the not only the text of this book, but the essence and the spirit wherein it was written. Let it speak to the marrow of your bones and learn from this book the law of liberty. Now, in the last lecture, lecture five of this series, up until the end of it, uh, this uh, that lecture, lecture five on page two twenty two of the book. If you're following along in the online version, we talked about how Bible believing Christians, from apostolic times until the rise of the papacy, from the rise of the papacy to its zenith of power during the twelfth century, where the when the papacy had grown to control all the kings of the earth and how he persecuted the saints 
and made war against the saints and wore out the saints and crucified and burned them alive at the stake. We learned about the Inquisitions and all of those Christians from the very beginning when they read the prophecies of Daniel and of Paul and of John, they unanimously agreed that it applied to the papacy. All the prophecies of Paul, John, and Daniel regarding the Antichrist, the little horn, the man of sin, the son of perdition, were unanimously applied to the papacy. Why? Because he perfectly fulfills those prophecies. Truly, this is a divine book, this Bible that we read. And the prophets, Daniel, Paul, and John, nailed it. Why? Because they got the truth directly from the truth, Christ himself. And they wrote it down just like God gave it to them. And we, we would do well to pay heed to what all true Bible-believing Christians have believed since the very beginning. And we should ask ourselves, if we don't believe that the papacy is the Antichrist and that the Roman Catholic Church is the scarlet heart of Revelation chapter 17, why not? Who changed the prophecies? Who changed history? Nobody. They stand alone by divine right. And they give the testimony that every man, woman, and child on this planet deserves to hear. Now, we've covered all the time from, the, from apostolic times all the way up into the Protestant Reformation. Now, what about the Protestant Reformation? What Reformation was there? How do you reform perfection? They were perfect in their beliefs, all Bible-believing Christians. They were unanimous in those beliefs. They were steadfast in their belief about who the Antichrist was and who the Scarlet Harlot was. Well, they weren't reforming the truth. They were trying to reform the Roman Catholic Church. But after a period of time, and not so long a time, it became apparent to the Protestant Reformers that they could not reform that church. It was prophesied to be what it is, and it was prophesied to be what it is until Christ's return. So in their, instead of trying to reform the Roman Catholic Church, out of which they came, they began just simply to tell the truth and to curse Rome to identify Rome for what she is and leave no, no one ignorant of that truth. They felt that it was their spiritual and bounden duty to Christ to expose to the world the Antichrist of Scripture, the scarlet harlot of Revelation chapter 17. And that's what fueled the Protestant Reformation. For the first time in history, it was Roman Catholics who saw in the scriptures themselves, after being prompted to read it for themselves, whereas heretofore, as Roman Catholics, they were not allowed to read the scriptures. Only the priest was allowed to read the scriptures. But true Bible-believing Christians like Tyndale, Wycliffe, Huss, Jerome, the Waldenses, the Huguenots, the Hussites, all of those who translated the scriptures made those scriptures available to these Roman Catholic monks in their own language. And even against Roman Catholic canon law, they read those scriptures for themselves. And like every Bible-believing Christian before them, they came to the unanimous conclusion they were right. The Pope is the Antichrist, the Papacy is the Antichrist, and the Roman Catholic Church out of which they came was the synagogue of Satan, the scarlet harlot of Revelation chapter 17. So a vast percentage 
of Roman Catholic monks and priests left the Roman Catholic Church in protest, and that's what started the Protestant Reformation. Unanimity, the solid unanimous belief that all Bible-believing Christians before that time were absolutely correct in their interpretation of the Bible prophecies of Daniel, Paul, and John. You want to belong to that family? You must give up futurism. It's a lie. It was a lie spread to deceive and to destroy Protestantism and to make us all return to the scarlet harlot and to the Antichrist. Because if you believe that the Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven years before Jesus Christ returns, then that exonerates the papacy and all of its diabolical history. That's why the papacy and all of its diabolical history, all of its wars and inquisitions are not taught in our schools today. It's not taught in our churches today because they do not want you to know the truth. But I'm all about the truth. So is Henry Gratton Guinness. So is Walt Stickle. And I believe you're here because you want to know the truth. And now we're going to talk about the truth as it was established by the Protestant reformers in the 16th century. This is Lecture 6. It begins on page 223 if you're following along. The title of this lecture, Interpretation and Use of These Prophecies in Protestant Reformation Times. Now we're going to see what we are supposed to be made of. It says the 16th century presents the spectacle of a stormy sunrise, a stormy sunrise after a dismal night. What's Henry Grattan Guinness talking about here? What was the stormy sunrise? It was the Protestant Reformation. Light came back into the world and illuminated the darkness of history, Roman Catholic history. The 16th century, the 1500s, the Protestant Reformation officially got its start on October 31st, 1517, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the Wittenberg church door, condemning the papacy for selling indulgences, the forgiveness of sins for money, just to finance the building of St. Peter's Cathedral in, in, in Rome, the Vatican today. That's right. The priests of Rome went throughout all of Europe saying, we will forgive all your sins for enough money. And believe it or not, the superstitious Roman Catholics of Europe put their money in the coffers of these diabolical priests, thinking that that would buy their way to heaven and the forgiveness of sins. That's how the Roman Catholic Church got so filthy rich. That's how St. Peter's Basilica, which was built on the proceeds of these blasphemous uh, uh, indulgences was built. Have you ever seen the inside of St. Uh, of St. Peter's Cathedral in, in uh, the Vatican? The inside of it. You've never seen such lavish stone and gold and silver and precious stones and pearls in your life. You've never seen so much idolatry, statues and images and idols in your life. And it all came from the proceeds. Filthy lucre, stolen by the priests of Rome under the pretense that they had the power to forgive sins for money. The Bible calls it simony. S-I-M-O-N-Y. Simony. Where do we get that word? Why, from the name Simon Magus. Remember, it was Simon Magus, and I believe it was Acts chapter 8, who confronted the apostle Peter, believing himself to be a Christian, and offering to buy from the apostle Peter the power to impart the Holy Spirit. And Peter said, and this may shock you, 
but you can go and read it for yourself. Peter said, your money perish with you. Okay? In Iowa farm lingo, it means you and your money go straight to hell. Now, now, now you, you, you're, you're reeling back in your chair, and you're saying to yourself, Tom is accusing Peter of being so harsh. Read it for yourself. Peter said, let me repeat, Peter said to Simon Magus, who offered to buy the power to impart the Holy Spirit to believers for money. He wanted to buy that neat little magic trick. He saw Peter laying on of hands and people receiving the Holy Ghost. He wanted to buy that. Remember, Simon Magus was a magi. That's why we call him Simon the Magus, Simon the Magi. And Acts chapter 8 says that he was believed to be the great power of God in Samaria. And he bewitched all the people until it is believed that he, he reformed to Christianity. He became a follower of Jesus Christ. But when he came to Peter and offered money for the power to impart the Holy Spirit, what he was actually trying to do was to buy an apostleship and then to use that apostleship, that authority, to impart the Holy Spirit to true believers. And listen again to what Peter told him. You think I've overstated this? Listen carefully to what Peter said. Thy money perish with you. That's why today, buying the forgiveness of sins from a Roman Catholic priest or anyone else for money is called simony. It is condemned in the Bible. The forgiveness of sins is free. It's the law of liberty. All we have to do is reach out and take it. God offers the forgiveness of sins for free. He paid the price for all of us. And all we have to do is take the gift. Somebody offers you a gift. What is it if you don't take it? It's not a gift. It's nothing. You have to take the free gift that Jesus offers, and it's a lifetime of bliss with him in the kingdom of heaven. It's forgiveness of all sins. It is to be imputed to us the same righteousness with which Christ is clothed. It is to be like him, and to be like him is to live forever in the absence of sin and the presence of Almighty God. We don't want to be simoniacs like the Roman Catholic priests. That was the dismal night that was shed away when the light of the gospel came to Roman Catholic Europe by these Roman Catholic reformers. Martin Luther, John Huss, Wycliffe, Tyndale, all the great Protestant names brought light to the dismal darkness of Roman Catholic Europe. They joined the body of Christ, not just in receiving Christ, which is our absolute necessity, but they, they, they covered the other base too. They rejected Christ's counterfeit. They condemned him for what he is. They told the world what he is, without shame, without controversy. They were unanimous in that belief. They were just as sure the papacy was the Antichrist. The Roman Catholic Church was the scarlet heart of Revelation 17, just as sure as that as they were that Christ was their redeemer. There's two sides of the Protestant coin, and you're about to hear it for yourself, right from the lips of Henry Grattan Dennis. He says, Europe awoke from 
the long sleep of superstition. What's he talking about? All this superstitious power that the Roman Catholic priests say that they have, that they can turn the wafer in the monstrance, the, 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 they call it the host, that they can turn this piece of bread into the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ and then offer him again as another sacrifice, the very same sacrifice that was committed upon the, the cross. What an abomination. They parade that piece of bread up and down the street, and they demand that you bow down and worship it as, as though it were Christ walking the streets. And if you didn't bow down and you didn't, pay homage and worship to that piece of bread carried by the priest, you were hauled off to the Inquisition, tried, condemned, and burned at the stake. That's right. You either worship Satan or you die by fire. We we serve a living God, a living, breathing, walking, talking God that sits at the right hand of the Father, makes intercession for us, and paid but one price for us. But superstition, Roman Catholic superstition, says Mary forgives your sins. The priest forgives your sins. You can't go to heaven unless the Pope says so. And you have to forsake God's law and accept Roman Catholic canon law. I could go on all night. It's all man-made superstition, and it has deceived the whole world. And at no time throughout history did it deceive God's people more than it has deceived This generation. But the Protestant Reformation came to the darkness of Roman Catholic Europe in the 16th century. Nations shook off Rome's chains. The dead arose. The witnesses to truth who had been silenced and slain stood up once more and renewed their testimony. That's what we need to do. Renew our testimony that Jesus is the Christ. He died once and for all. The Pope is an imposter. The Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan. We need to abandon the ecumenical movement and hold fast to Christ and recurse the darkness. Do you know where that term came from? That little cliche, well, I'd rather live the truth than curse the darkness. How convenient for Rome that she can put out a little slogan, a little cliche like that, and it's picked up by every brainless twit in the world and repeated as though it came from the Bible. We are to champion the light and to curse the darkness, and that darkness is Rome. And it was cursed by the Protestant reformers. It was cursed by the Huguenots, the Hussites, the Waldenses, even the apostolic Christians who lived at a time long before the papacy ever came to being. They knew what was coming, and they cursed it before its arrival. Why are we so silent? Is there no Protestantism left in this country? Henry Grattan Guinness says, the dead arose. The witnesses to truth had been silenced and slain once more renewed their testimony. They stood up and renewed their testimony. What was their testimony? That Jesus is the Christ, the Redeemer of all mankind, and the papacy is a counterfeit. He says the martyred confessors reappeared in the reformers. That's right. All the martyrs of Jesus prior to the Protestant Reformation were made manifest once again in the world by the Protestant reformers. Why? Because they believe the same thing, that Jesus is the Christ and the papacy is the Antichrist. Rome had silenced that through the Inquisitions and the wars and the Crusades. But when the Protestant Reformation came, those dead, slain, safe, blood-bought Christians who had been martyred by the Roman Catholic Church, who had been martyred by the Antichrist, the persecutor of the saints, were seen once again in the streets in the bodies of the Protestant reformers. They were of the same spirit. They weren't the same people, but they were of the same belief, the same spirit, and they repeated what every Bible-believing, blood-bought Christian had said and declared all the way from apostolic times to the present. 
And when you listen to me, you're listening to another one of them Protestants, one of them true believers. Yes, I believe Jesus is the Christ. I'm a blood-bought Christian. I've been born again by the Spirit of Almighty God, by the election of Almighty God. But that's only half the story. There's a counterfeit in the world that seeks to usurp God's rightful throne and to make us all slaves to him. And that is the papacy. That's the other side of the coin. Yes, we live the truth. We champion the truth. But we also thirst the darkness, the same as every blood-bought Christian before us. He said the martyred confessors of Christ reappeared in the Protestant reformers. There was a cleansing in the spiritual sanctuary, civil and religious liberty, civil and religious liberty. Did you hear me? Civil liberty and religious liberty were inaugurated. See, before the Protestant Reformation, you were a spiritual slave to the Pope. You couldn't go to heaven unless he turned the key for you. You couldn't have your sins forgiven unless the priest forgave your sins. And also, the civil government, no matter where you lived in Roman Catholic Europe, the kings were all crowned by the Pope. They had their kingdoms by the behest of the Pope. And if they did not do what the Pope said, they lost their head. They lost their crown. And the Pope picked another king. So the civil governments of the world served the papacy, and they upheld Roman Catholic canon law. So prior to the Protestant Reformation, there was no liberty that the Pope didn't give. And the Pope, if he gives you a liberty, he can take it away. So says Roman Catholic canon law, and that's what he did. He took away the liberty of the people. <laughs> you couldn't speak a word against the civil government or the church, the Roman Catholic Church. If you did, the civil government was to arrest you and hold you until the inquisitors could make trial in a tribunal and condemn you to death as a heretic. That's why we have the First Amendment in this country. We have the First Amendment for the sole purpose to give us liberty to criticize both the civil and the religious authority in this world. There were Protestants in the colonies who would not ratify the Constitution of the United States until they were guaranteed these liberties. They had to be amended to the Constitution. That's where we get our Bill of Rights. The very first right that was received through the Bill of Rights was the guarantee that we would always be free to criticize the Pope and the King so that never, never again, especially in the United States of America, could the Pope dictate spiritually or through the civil power what we could say or do or anything else. Okay? You want to be free? You have to be free to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, and you have to be free to condemn the papacy and the civil government that upholds the law of the Roman Catholic Church and deprives its citizens of the liberty whereby Christ hath made us free. That's been totally lost in the United States of America. There isn't a drop of Protestantism left in this country. Now, sure, there's plenty of people that say, oh, I have the First Amendment right. They have absolutely no concept that that right came from Protestantism. That right came from Jesus Christ who paid it all and made us free. Do you know why Paul was killed by Rome? Do you know why John the Revelator was imprisoned by Rome? Because they demanded that they maintain their law of liberty that Christ made them free. They criticized Rome. 
They criticized the paganism of the Roman Empire. They preached Jesus and him crucified, that all the gods of the Roman Empire were not gods at all, that there was no grace in any of them, only in Christ. And the Roman government, which stood on the, the authority of all the pagan gods of the, of, the, of the Gentile nations throughout history, all the way back to Babylon, said, you stop preaching this Jesus. And Paul wouldn't stop preaching Jesus, neither would John. And they would not stop condemning the future Roman Antichrist, because Paul understood it would be the papacy. Whatever replaced the Caesars would be the Antichrist of Scripture. That's why Paul lost his head. That's why John was in prison. Should we be any different than Paul and John? Sure, they preached Jesus. The government said, you shall not preach this Jesus. And they went to their deaths preaching Jesus and condemning the Antichrist, informing the world who that restrainer was and that when he was gone, he'd be replaced by the Antichrist, and the, Rome, and the Antichrist would be a Roman. The papacy would build its foundation on the foundation laid by the pagan Roman Caesars, and it's played out in history just as perfectly as they prophesied it. It's still perfectly fulfilled in the papacy. But how many of us would give up our lives, give up our heads, for preaching Jesus and preaching against the counterfeit in Rome. Well, you've got me as one of them. Will there any of you join me? I'd be proud. I'd be blessed of God to stand on the rack, just like Paul, just like John. And that may be my end, but I won't be silent. I won't let anybody strip for me the right that Jesus gave me that is embodied in the First Amendment even of our Protestant Bill of Rights. I have the right given to me by Jesus Christ, the creator of all heaven and earth. He said, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. The fullness thereof. I have a right to preach Jesus Christ on the Internet. I have the right to preach Jesus Christ on amateur radio. I have a right to curse the, the darkness of this world, both on the Internet and on amateur radio and everywhere else I go. And even at the pain of death, that's what I intend to do. And it's cost me plenty. But the cost is trivial compared to the glory that awaits me when I go home to meet my Savior. Civil and religious liberty were inaugurated. No, it wasn't inaugurated during the Protestant Reformation. God's people have always had civil and religious liberty. Those who just simply claimed it and lived it. Cost many of them their lives. Millions and millions and millions Rome has slain because they would not, they could not obey the papacy or the civil government over which the papacy ruled. I, they said to themselves and to everyone else, are we to obey man or God? The discovery of printing and revival of learning accelerated the movement. Yeah, that's right. Before the Protestant Reformation, one was not taught to read by the priests. Because if they taught you to read, you might read the scriptures for yourself and find out the Roman Catholic priests are frauds that the papacy is the Antichrist and the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan. If you read the book for yourself, you might become a Protestant and abandon the Roman Catholic Church, and St. Peter's Basilica would never be finished. But because of the Protestant Reformation, learning became important. It became important to every Protestant 
of Europe to teach their children to read for no other purpose that they could read the scriptures, God's holy word for themselves and see why every Bible-believing Christian before them condemned the darkness of Rome. Do you know you read today because of the Protestant Reformation? If it were up to our government, if it were up to the Roman Catholic Church, if it were up to the papacy, we wouldn't be allowed to read the scriptures. All the books would be burned, and especially the diabolical history of the Roman Catholic Church. That's why you find none of these books in the schools, the libraries, the colleges, the universities. You have to hunt in old, dusty bookstores to find the truth in this country. He says... There was progress everywhere. What do you think the Protestant reformers regarded as progress? Independence from Rome. They shook off the iron chains of Rome. That was progress. That's what they called progress. Now he says, Columbus struck across the ocean and opened up a new hemisphere to view. Let me make a comment about this. Isn't it uncanny that this usurper in Rome, this blasphemous usurper in Rome that says, no, the earth is mine and all the fullness thereof, launched the Columbus expedition to the Western Hemisphere in order to claim this land for himself under the tenets of the donation of Constantine. Just at the very time when God was liberating all his believers in Europe, Rome found a new field of operations, a land that had never heard the gospel. And Rome took advantage. The, the, the country that we now call the United States of America has been always and forever regarded by the papacy as her property by divine right. And that she and only she has the right to rule this country. The papacy is the king of kings and the lord of lords, according to Roman Catholic canon law. And this land was established as a papal conquest during Columbus's expedition. Columbus was sent under the auspices of Spanish Ferdinand and Isabella, who were diabolical servants of the Antichrist. And they set sail for the Western Hemisphere to claim all lands for the Pope. Rome's had a claim on this land. As phony as it is, she has worked that claim to perfection. She believes she has a divine right to do it. And once she has conquered it, she's going to put down all opposition because she believes that, too, is her divine right. She exercised that right in Europe to the tune of hundreds of millions of Bible-believing Christians, and that's just exactly what she intends to do here in the Western Hemisphere. Once Rome has given, been raised to the ascendancy that she desires, once she feels she is safe to do so, after the Protestant Reformation has been destroyed by futurism and ecumenism, Rome is going to start killing right here in Protestant USA, burn and kill the heretics. And if that's not true, then explain to me what she did in Europe in the dark days, the dark ages, before the light of the Protestant Reformation liberated them. God's people were liberated in Europe. Now the darkness has come to Western Hemisphere, and Protestantism is losing the fight. Why? Because they don't even know there is a fight. They don't know there's a Rome to shun and a heaven to gain. That's the truth. He says, Columbus struck across the ocean and opened a new hemisphere to view Rome was shaken on her seven hills and lost one half her dominions. That's right, one half of Rome of, of the Roman dominions were liberated by the Protestant Reformation. Do you know what happened during the Protestant Reformation that, that 
that caused Rome to lose half of her dominions? First of all, Rome had control of nearly half of all the tillable land in Rome. Because Roman Catholics, the superstitious Roman Catholics, believe that they can buy their way to heaven by money or gifts to the Roman Catholic Church. So what they do? Instead of leaving their land and their farms and their domains to their children, their heirs, as is instructed in the Bible, they gave their lands, their properties, and everything to the church to buy themselves salvation. Simoniacs, every one of them. They let their children starve and go without to become slaves to the papacy who now owned their inheritance. So Rome, after centuries and centuries and centuries of practicing simony, controlled over 50% of the tillable land and much of the cities. The people wanted that land back. And when the Protestant Reformation came, they realized the Pope was the Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Church was the synagogue of Satan. They forcibly overthrew their papal civil governments. And then they wrote constitutions that guaranteed the rights that the papacy had taken away. They gathered up armies. They elected their own kings, queens, and, and, and leaders, political leaders, and demanded that they observe the liberties for which Christ has made us free, and they stripped Rome of all those properties that the Simoniacs had given Rome. Rome was bleeding arterially. It looked for all the world that the papacy would be no more. Half of her territories were taken back. They weren't stolen from the papacy. They were taken back to their rightful heirs. God's people. You see, God has chosen to bless his people by the fruit of the ground. That's why Adam and Eve were gardeners. That's the method by which God has promised to bless his people. By the free produce of the ground. All you have to do is work it, put the seed in, cultivate it, and raise the crop, and harvest it, and use it as you see fit. And spend the money from the proceeds to protect your to, to to supply your family, but that's not the way it is now. In the old world order, in the dark days, Rome owned the ground, and the people were slaves to the Pope. Yes, they farmed the ground, but they got none of the proceeds. Only but what pittance the papacy would leave them. The governments of their nations were saddled with heavy taxation from the papacy. So whatever wealth that the papacy gave the citizenry was paid in taxes to the government that went to the papacy. Do we want that to be restored in this country? Do you know why you get up in the morning and work at least three or four hours, depending upon what you, what you earn, three or four hours of each day goes in taxes? And where do you think those tax monies go? If they don't go directly to Rome, they go to the military and industrial complex so that we can fight papal proxy wars to help conquer the rest of the world for the Pope. Do you see any familiarity with today? The days after the light had come to the world and the darkness that was destroyed by that light? It's just as dark today as it ever was. But to ask the average Christian, why, this is the greatest country that there ever was. I'm proud to be an American. It's the same as saying, I am proud to be an inquisitor for Rome. I am proud to be a serf and a slave to Rome. I'm very happy to pay my taxes to the government so that Rome can be prospered and protected. Do you still think it's wrong and politically incorrect to curse the darkness? See, in the churches today, they say, I'd rather live in the light than curse the darkness. Oh, that sounds so holy, doesn't it? But because the pastors, those dumb dogs that don't bark, because 
They don't preach. They don't curse the darkness. We're ignorant of what the darkness was. Do you know that I absolutely had no idea? Up until the the time that God opened my eyes, I had no idea of any Roman Catholic Church history. Oh yes, they taught us they taught us about the dark ages in school, but they never told us what it was. Because to do so would be politically incorrect. No, it'd be well, religious persecution they call it. Anti Roman Catholic bigotry. But look what it cost me. I spent my whole life being completely ignorant that Rome runs our government just as she did during the the dark ages and that I work like everyone else three or four hours a day to pay for Rome's control and to fight in her papal proxy wars to help conquer the rest of the world to make them all slaves to Rome. You still call it anti-Roman Catholic bigotry? Or is it the truth? The biblical, historical, and prophetic truth. It's all right to live in the light, but it's also your Protestant Christian responsibility to curse the darkness because it is the darkness that has enslaved us all without our knowledge. They've kept back our wages by fraud. Fraud is a violation of God's holy law. It's telling a lie. It's stealing from God's people. We have allowed them to steal from us, to take from the righteous, to give to the wicked. And that's why our society, because it has strengthened the wicked, that's why our society is so morally corrupt a moral corruption that has even found a home in the churches of this country by whatever denomination. And it's time for us to curse the darkness or become abject slaves and martyrs to it. The discovery of printing and revival of learning accelerated the Protestant Reformation. There was progress everywhere. Columbus struck across the ocean and opened up a new hemisphere to view. Rome was shaken on her seven hills and lost one half her dominions. Protestant nations were created. The modern world was called into existence. Don't miss the point here. You've heard of the modern world, but no one has ever told you that it is directly related to the dawning of the light at the Protestant Reformation. Whenever you hear the word modern, you must think in your mind to fully understand what it means, the Protestant. That's what brought us the modern age. Liberty from papal tyranny. Liberty from Rome's spiritual tyranny and blasphemy and whoredoms. Liberty from civil governments that served only the papacy, the Antichrist of Scripture. The modern world, the Protestant world, that was made liberated by the liberty whereby Christ had made us free. We have our own kingdom. We have our own king, and we have our own law. Why do we need civil law? How can we serve two masters? And what a choice is there? Christ who paid it all? Christ who gives the increase for free? Or the papacy who threatens us and wants to do us a favor and then taxes us into oblivion? You know why Israel was being taxed by Rome? because they gave up the law of liberty. They didn't see Christ as their savior, their rescuer, their deliverer. They wanted Rome to do that. And when they rejected Jesus Christ, 
Jesus returned to his father. And regarding Israel, he simply had to wipe his hands and let them have their way. And Rome had her way with Israel. That is what is happening to us today. You abandon the law of liberty, salvation by grace through faith. It's free. It's a gift. It's by election of God. And you take handouts from the civil government with strings attached. Whenever you take a handout from the government, the government comes and says, we want to help you. That's when you want to run because you reject the law of liberty and you accept the slavery of the civil government, which serves the papacy, the proxy by which Rome rules your life. You take a handout from the federal, state, county, or local government, you are submitting to their authority. You are submitting to comply with their rules and regulations that run directly contrary to the law of liberty, and you make yourself a voluntary slave, and you got no one to blame but yourself. And don't think I'm being hard on you, because at 59 years old, I have found myself to be an abject slave of Rome, and I am mortified by it. I repent. And I'm going to preach the law of liberty till the day I die. The law of Christ. Liberty. Freedom. I'm going to tell you a little story before I run out of time. I've got a neighbor. I won't use his name. But he's been a heathen all his life, never knew Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, he hates Christianity. And, of course, (laughs) Christianity being what it is in the United States today, I just don't blame him. Okay? I sympathize with the man. Anyway, he's uh, 70-some-odd years old, got macular degeneration and cataracts, and he's legally blind. He had to give up his driver's license. And he lives alone. And the only way he's got to get around is either to walk or to ride on a golf cart that he bought. A golf cart. That's what the man relies on. A golf cart. He relies on that thing, too. He goes uptown and gets his groceries. Without that golf cart, he has to rely on someone else. And he loves his liberty. He doesn't want to be beholden to anyone. He wants to be self-sufficient. Even in his blinded state, for as long as it lasts, what little sight he's got left, he wants to maintain liberty. Now, i got to love the one, myself who understands now for the first time in my life the law of liberty. i got to admire that pagan, godless heathen who wants to maintain liberty in his life. So I thought, how can I help this man and tell him about the law of liberty? Well, his golf cart broke broke down. He couldn't get around. He was blind. And I'm thinking, that golf cart's got a two-stroke engine in it, and I can tear one down and put it back together with my eyes closed. I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to fix that old man's golf cart for him, his golf cart for him. And then I'm going to teach him about the law of liberty. He loves his liberty so much, I'm going to make him appreciate his liberty more than he ever has in his life. So I went over there, and I tore the fuel pump apart, Turns out that he used gasohol in an old golf cart before gasohol was cool, and it ruined all the components inside the fuel pump. It wasn't pumping fuel. And I thought, well, he's burnt gasohol in this thing. It's probably destroyed the carburetor, and it's probably destroyed the seals in the crankcase, and I'm going to have to tear this engine completely apart and fix it. But I can do it, and I will do it, and I will do it for free. 
just like Jesus who came and redeemed me for free. That's how I'm going to witness the gospel truth, the law of liberty, to that godless old man. So I went over and I said, neighbor, I'm going to help you. I can tear that engine down. I can tear down every component in that golf cart and make it run as good as new. And I won't charge you a dime, not one thin dime. And the only cost you'll incur is the cost of the parts, and they've got to be cheap as dirt. And I'll have you up and running in no time. So he says, well, boy, you come at the right time because I can't see to fix this thing. I don't even know what's wrong with it. I've never worked on an engine like this, and I don't have a clue where to start even if I could see. And I said, stand back. And I started in on that baby, and I had her running like a brand new one. And he was so thankful that he said, I'm going to come over and there's whenever you get ready to pick up all that firewood, you cut down them trees and sawed it all up, worked your fingers to the bone, all by yourself, no help. I'm going to come over to help you. I didn't say too much. As time went on, he kept offering. When are you going to pick up that firewood? I'll come over and help you. And I says, neighbor, you don't owe me anything. What I did for you was free out of the goodness of my heart. It was a gift. Now, if I were to hand you a gift, out of the goodness of my heart, hand you a gift, what would you do if you reached down in your pocket to pay me for it, to recompense me for it in some fashion, whether by money or labor? It's no longer a gift, is it? He said, no, I reckon not. No, it wouldn't any longer be a gift out of the goodness of my heart. That's bad enough, but what's even worse, you rob from me the blessing of giving out of the goodness of my heart. And let me tell you what's even worse than that. Jesus Christ is the rewarder of the saints. Jesus Christ is the rewarder of the saints. And if I have any reward coming, for the goodness of my heart to help an old man, then it should come from Christ and not you because I want you to be free, neighbor. I want you to be able to get on that golf cart and rip and tear up and down the streets. Go get your go get your groceries. Go to the doctor. Do whatever you can. It just thrills my heart to see an old man who loves his liberty enough to go running up and down the streets in a golf cart. And there's nothing more in this world than I love than to be blessed and rewarded by my Savior. You steal from me that reward if I were to accept payment. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. Let me tell you something, neighbor. If this whole world understood and knew the law of liberty, do you know none of us would be in debt? He thought for a moment, and I saw the light come on in his eyes. Do you realize the government comes here, the federal government, the state government, the county government, even the city local government comes to say, we want to help you. We want to help you. And you stick out your hand and you take it. But when you do, you find yourself with Roman chains. No longer are you free to think and say what you feel in your heart. No longer can you do with your property as you please. You have to abide by federal, state, local, county, government rules and regulations. You have to pay taxes on that land. 
to the tune of at least three or four hours of your work day to pay for that help that they give you. Well, let me tell you, neighbor, I'm not like the federal government. I'm not like the state government. I'm not like the county government, and I'm not like the municipal government. When I give, I give freely because I receive freely from Jesus, the rewarder of the saints. And now for the first time in your life, old man, you've seen Christ. Do you still hate him? Do you still resent him? Or do you want to be like him? I want to be like him. I said, so you get on your golf cart and be free. No obligation. You owe me nothing but to get on that golf cart and rip tear up and down the streets. And he looked at me and he said, well, I'd still like to help you pick up that firewood. And I said, then, only according to the law of liberty. Do it out of the goodness of your heart. Hold me no charge. He said, that's the way we'll do it. Oh, no man, anything. That's the law of liberty. Because if you owe a man anything, he will make you a slave. He's got a claim on your life, and he will use that claim to corrupt your morals. And that's what Rome has done. Rome has done it directly and indirectly through the civil governments, federal, state, county, and local governments. They've even done it through your 501c3 churches. You walk in, what's the preacher say? You got the gospel today. If God has blessed you, then you owe me. And you pay me in tithes, 10%. You want to get rich? You got to pay me. I'm the priest. See, they built our churches, our Protestant churches, after the very image of Rome. You want to be rich? We want to help you. We'll give you the gospel, you give us our, your money, and then we'll give your money to the World Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, the ecumenical movement. We'll be able to make more movies like the Left Behind series that'll lead you into the pits of hell, that'll convince you the Pope is not the Antichrist, that he's some fool that looks like Mitt Romney, some temple-grade Mitt Romney that'll show up about seven years before Jesus Christ returns, And uh, then you'll have your Antichrist. But in the meantime, we are the shepherds. And we will hit. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know there is heaven also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior, we're too.
total loss.